Hello? Okay, cool. Thanks for making that long walk down here. I, uh, I walked down here and then saw Grand on the door, and I was like, I'm in the wrong spot. I'm looking for Brand. So I walked all the way back down there and all the way back. So uh, my apologies uh, for uh, being a bit tardy here. Um, I'm going to switch to uh, another laptop here and uh, get this thing queued up, and then we'll get started. Give me one second. Okay, it's on here. Good design PDF. Oh, you have a pointer or clicker too? Jeez. Sweet. Okay. Uh, before I get started, a round of applause for Tyler just saved this thing, by the way. God, what a nice guy. Um, so thanks for coming. Um, do we have like any industrial designers or developers here? What's the audience like? Do you do industrial design? Anybody do industrial design? Okay. Uh, neither do I. Uh, what o developers? We had one. UX people? Okay. Cool. Um, well, thanks for coming to this. Uh, here's my contact information. You can tweet at me if you want to. Uh, at Indeed It's Read. You notice that uh, my, um, my background uh, on my last email is uh, at Worrell. Worrell is a product design firm in northeast Minneapolis, uh, but I am not an industrial designer. Actually, just work a, 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 I work around a lot of them. So uh, by osmosis and some of my other work experiences, which I'll share in just a sec, uh, that's really what's kind of educating what I'm sharing with you guys here. Uh, today. So for the background, um, I started off at Iconoculture. Uh, that later got purchased by CEB. That was a uh, basically a marketing consumer trends company. So why do people do what they do? What are their values? How are they motivated to make their different various purchases decisions? Why do they care about anything? So I kind of got brought up with that methodology and that's really stuck with me since. So you'll see a little bit of that flavor as we're going through this. Uh, after that, I totally crashed and burned with my own tech startup. I was one of four founders uh, with a company called Heroic. It was a competitive product to Angie's List. So you could, uh, oh, we just lost this one. No, oh, and we're back. So um, with Heroic, uh, competitive product to Angie's List, um, the differentiation being you link with the people that you know uh, and see reviews from your friends rather than from total strangers. So great idea. We never figured out how to monetize it. We ran out of our money. I moved on to uh, my next life, which is at Worrell. So I've been with uh, Worrell for a year and a half. Um, and it's a, it's a really fun place to work. Again, round of applause for this guy. Um, uh, it, it's fun to work around designers. I used to think I was a designer, and then I went and worked with designers, and then I'm like, I can no longer call myself that, because these guys are crazy, crazy talented, these guys and girls. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is what, what is good design, and how do you, de how do you define it, uh, and how do you make sure that you try to accomplish that. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with a few examples. Right? So I'll just click through these. These, these are things I pulled. Uh, some of the industrial designers and UX people uh, where I work said, hey, you know, what, kind of, what comes to mind if someone were to ask you, um, you know, what is uh, one really, really great, great product? Uh, so these are, these are some of the responses. We've got the KitchenAid um, mixer, 
These are great. My wife and I have one of these. They're like tanks. It's amazing. And they look sexy. Uh, I also want to kind of bring in some of the digital stuff. Obviously, we're a tech community here, so there's a lot of people working with screens. Um, and I would say the, the, the lessons that we're going to talk through today um, apply to both product, um, physical product and digital product. I don't think there's any difference. Obviously, there's some usability uh, and development problems, uh, but the, the pure essence of what is it you're making and what does it do and why should anybody care, that's all the same. So uh, another example, Square Cash. Did anybody use Square Cash? It's the best way to, to exchange cash. I mean, it literally takes two seconds. If, if your friend owes you five bucks and you know they're never going to pay you, you can take out Square Cash, ask for five dollars, put in their phone number, it's going to hit them up with a text message uh, saying, hey, where's my five bucks? Um, and all you need is a 16-digit uh, a uh, pin for a debit card. There's no signups. There's no, um, you know, like using uh, PayPal or any of those other forums. They ask you about ten different things. Nope, same thing. Um, Square Cash doesn't do that. Give me just a second here. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. Sure. The. Uh, Trying to think through the next one. I mean, obviously, it, it works a little bit better better with visuals. Well, it looks like we got it here. Next one. Um, this was a car design. Uh, one of our industrial designers really loves um, retro, so he he suggested that I use this. This is actually a concept car that somebody created ten years ago. Uh, you can see it's dated. It's super modular. The dash is is beautiful. Colors are bright. Um, everybody laughed at this person when, when they, they put this out uh, about 10 years ago. Now car companies are actually revisiting it um, because it's, it, it, it's the essence of its design are actually pretty foundational. Uh, and we're going to kind of explore some of those things for the reasons why in just a sec. Another example, just something you would find around the kitchen, um, the Hashimi porcelain uh, collection. Really nothing too spectacular about that one other than it's just simple. Um, you know you can trust it. You just look at it and you'd say, you know what, it's not going to break. Visually it communicates that to you and, that, and that's, what, uh, that's what good design does. Next example is uh, with moleskin. So nothing super fancy, just a little notebook that you put in your pocket, but the people who use these things love them. Um, they're easy to replace, they fit in your pocket, they're lightweight, they're durable. They just have this texture to them that just makes you feel like you're like, uh, like a mountain guy for some reason. I don't know why. It's great. Uh, the uh, Rubbermaid lunchbox set, right? Nothing too fancy, but people who have this love it. Uh, we've got a UX designer at work who's just like won't shut up about this, and it, it just keeps things in a nice little container, uh, and and that's all it needs to do. This is the uh, REI Half Dome Tent. I own this one. Uh, it is awesome. I think people who design tents should design every single product because the way that they get so much utility in a, such a little space just blows my mind. Um, and then uh, the mailbox app. The, this is probably a little bit more common. I would imagine we've got some mailbox users, right? In the audience, nobody used mailbox? OK, good. All right, it's, it's great. Keeps your organ your uh, your uh, uh, email organized. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to kind of fill in this blank. Uh, good design is, we just reviewed a few examples of, of good design, some of which you saw and some of which you missed because the screen keeps dying. But um, let's, let's just kind of shout out, of the examples you just saw, what did you see? What was the consistency? Well, intuitive. intuitive, simple, good, clean. Functional, nice. Any others? Obvious. What do you mean by that? Yeah, you look at it and it's intuitive. Yep. Beautiful, good. Uh, I filled in this blank and I said subjective. Uh, and I threw this out to the, the, the rest of the designers 
And I go, are you comfortable with me saying this? Um, and, and they were a little uncomfortable with me saying it at first. I go, hear me out. Um, you know, we just looked at, a, at, a, at some series of, of, uh, of products. And the, the, the caveat here um, is there are some things that are foundational in good design, right? Is it innovative? Is it useful? We heard that one. Does it look pretty? Is it understandable, to your point? Obtrusive, D does it fit into my life? Or do I have to accommodate this thing? Is it honest? You know, again, kind of knowing you look at it and uh, instantly you can kind of, you know, see what it is. Is it long lasting or is it this thing, a piece of shit that I'm gonna throw away in, in a week? Um, thorough, you know, there's no kind of, I hate when you see a product and it's like, this is just not finished, right? It's, it's thorough means it's, it's, it's complete. Safe, um, and then a lot of times when you look at stuff and you see good design, it's because there's as, li as little design as possible. They haven't, you know, overdone the, uh, the design. So when I say design is subjective, I'm gonna get into wh what I mean by that, but I also wanna speak to our forefathers uh, ahead of us uh, and, and really do recognize that there are certain things that you can focus on as a developer or designer that are going to get you ahead of the pack. And those are what we just shared. So this is what I mean by uh, design is subjective. Those are those same words that you just saw in the last one, right? Well, we all care about all of these things. It's back. We, we care about all of these things the exact same, right? Every single one of us in this room. Of course not. So therefore, as a designer, and, and we know that these things are going to be varying person to person, how do we go about making the decisions of which ones to dial up and which ones to dial back? Right? So that's what, I, that's what we're talking about here today. There is no, uh, there is no, there's a bar that people expect, but the, what they expect beyond that is very variable. Um, so we're going to go in through an example to talk about that. Here's two radios. It's a clock radio, something we can all, we can all uh, you know, fami be familiar with. You got the one on the left, beautiful white, nice wood top, clearly some sort of pairing with your iPhone. And then we've got the one that you'd find in uh, a garage of somebody who's 80. Um, so you look at those two things and you say, okay, um, you know, why do some people buy this one? And why do some people buy the other one? Well, that's because when you take a look at people, what, they, what they're looking for, kind of beyond that kind of core design element, uh, is varying. So we've got, let's call her Emma here. Uh, Emma, Emma really cares for things that are aesthetic. She's a young, good-looking gal. She clearly takes care of herself, and she probably wants her, the things that she has in her life to, to reflect that, right? So the aesthetic is higher. Um, she also, let's just say for an example, wants a product that is safe, right? She, she doesn't wanna be around a harmful thing uh, and something that's long lasting. Now let's take a look at Dale. Dale buys the other radio. The other radio, it, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with, with the, the one for Emma. They both sold, and that's the point, is they both were on a shelf, and both of these people bought something. But that's because one product matched for Emma, the other product matched for Dale. And the reason that there's some differences are because they value things differently. So as we are, as we are coming up with new ideas, new services, new websites, new products. The reason that I share that example with you is because I want to emphasize the importance of knowing who it is you're selling to. Because if you're gonna go right down the line at the beginning, you remember how they were all kind of lined up? If that's your target, y y it's not possible. You might find some people like, that's, that's my zone. But unless you've kind of made some adjustments to understand who your core target is, you can't design one thing that everybody loves. And that's because design is sub subjective. 
So let's keep going with Emma here. Um, here's a little bit more about what we know. So now we've picked a target, and now we need to know a little bit more about her. She's 25. I, I think she, you look at her, she probably works at Target. She's 5'5", five, 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 uh, 110 pounds, not that that matters. Um, she's got a, a nice salary, she's single, uh, and she rents, right? Uh, Dale, on the other hand, he's older, he's a woodsman. You know, he, he doesn't, he's, he's got a couple friends and, 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 you know, they evaluate him based on how well he can uh, survive in the wilderness. Um, so their values are very different. So if we're looking at Emma, we picked her, we need to get to know her. Who is she? What does she value? What does she care about? What are her needs? Thinking about the environment in which she lives. Is anybody uh, in this room done any sort of uh, segmentation work before? A little bit? To what extent? Like, uh, how, how, my question, I guess, is how, how deep uh, have you dug into some of these, these groups? Just surface level? Mm-hmm. I mean, you can get lost, right? Because if you're just trying to find just Emma, right, then now you just develop something for one person. You probably don't want to do that unless that one person is willing to, you know, cover the cost of your efforts. So you find people like Emma, right? So, and then you find an audience and you figure out if that audience is the right size. Um, so you're making these, these judgments and trade-offs and you have to figure out how much do we need to know versus, okay, I think we have enough to move forward. And that's a, that's a tough thing to figure out, um, but it, you know, with practice, uh, it, it should help. And the purpose of getting to know Emma is, as, de as designers and as people who are, are, are developing things, w the, the purpose of getting to know Emma is so that we can figure out what are Emma's product requirements versus what are, what are Emma's uh, preferences. And the difference between those two things are you developing a product that um, is on time, on budget, works well in the market, and something that gets totally scope creeped, totally destroyed, never makes the market because you're 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 not you're chasing a moving target, right? Okay, so here's here's kind of Emma's life. Um, this is what we kind of get to know about her. She she loves the nest. Um, her apartment looks like it's a, uh, a page out of Pottery Barn. Uh, we've got this cute little duster. It can't just be a tin pan. It's got to have a face on it. Uh, and, you know, there's kind of like some earthy tones about her. Volkswagen is a, a nice car, it's, but it's not too pretentious. So, you know, she's got some, some, some values towards uh, kind of modesty. So, Let's kind of go back to say, okay, we just, we just kind of took a look into Emma's world. We just, we just got to know her a bit. Now let's go back and evaluate her against these things, right? Because, again, these, these uh, criteria are going to be how we develop product requirements versus uh, uh, preferences and, and, and what are your feature set going to be, whether it's for a website or for a product. So we're looking at this, this, um, this analysis again. What you're going to see down here is, okay, uh, when we're trying to assess uh, product requirements, well, the product requirements are, are kind of like, what does she know? Um, she has uh, a clock radio already, so she knows what that's like. So from a product requirements perspective, she probably doesn't want to rebuy the same thing. She also probably doesn't want to buy the same, pay more for the same features as what she has now. So we're working with a set of expectations that Emma has that are based on what she already is familiar with. So what she knows is kind of where you start from a baseline. Those are your product requirements. From there, you move into kind of the wants territory, right? So this is like her, her normal, her, the clock radio that she owns right now um, 
it, it, it doesn't do these things, but her friends that, her, that she saw at her house does that, and I really want that. She knows that these features exist, either from other competitive products that she's seen or from other products that she owns, right? So maybe um, she's got a hair dryer that has this really, really sexy kind of red handle that fits her hand just right. And she wants that same kind of essence that she sees in that product to, to be in everything that she has, because she just loves it so much, right? So these are the things that she's aware of, right? They exist around the product. The hardest thing to do is the delights. These are the things that she didn't know were po she didn't know was possible. And as d designers, these are the hardest things to do because in large part, we don't know they're possible either. So we have to make them up. Um, the, the, the best designers are the ones who are able to consistently hit those things that I'm calling delights. It's not easy to do. Um, and, and that's because, for the most part, nobody knows if it's possible. So up to that point, it's possible. Now it's not. OK, so why is it important to go through that assessment and understanding what are her basic expectations versus what are her nice-to-haves versus what is this thing that's going to blow her mind? Um, well, the purpose of that is because if you don't go through that, you're going to try to pack in way too many things because you, you don't know what you're going to do, right? You have no goal. You have no target. You have no specifications. And if you have no specifications, you're not going to develop a product. So this is an example. And that's the purpose. You want to avoid uh, feature creep. So you, you, you develop to her expectations. Then you give her a, a little bit more based on what else she might be familiar with and then develop something. If you have the time, the money, uh, and the willpower and creativity to do to give something that's, that's beyond. So let's go through each one of those steps again. The first one is uh, defining requirements. So how do we do that? We already kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, so that first, that first kind of column here on the left was uh, requirements. So how do, you do about, how do you go about doing that? We talked about competitive assessments. You say, okay, what are the, some of the other products that exist? You don't want to be selling something that looks worse, costs more, and lasts not as long. That's a terrible product, right? So you get a little bit of uh, research done on what else is out there. Ergonomics. So in Emma's case, it, let's talk about a clock radio. Uh, you know, Emma is is a a dainty person, let's let's say, right? So you don't want this clock radio to be 75 pounds. Not like anyone would ever design a clock radio that's 75 pounds, but um, in other products and in other um, digital developments too, you have to consider how does it interact with the human body. So if we're thinking digital, font size as one. Um, you know, what are the physical limitations of what this interface is going to be like. And those are different for everyone, uh, like we've been talking about. Dale, on the other hand, if you gave him a knob, you know, that was, you know, quite a wrist workout, he might be all about it, but not Emma. Limitations are, uh, what I mean by that is, um, it's more, more of an assessment of, you know, what are you capable of? If you have uh, a certain development resource that you're working with, um, maybe that developer can only write code in this language, right? Well, that means that you're going to have to design something within that limitation. Same thing could be said about supply chain limitations, material limitations, technology limitations. You have to know what your fence is in order to, 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 de to design within it. Okay, did that all make sense for requirements? Any questions on that? I'm going to move on to those kind of like wants next. All right, quiet group. All right, so defining preferences. Um, again, we, we kind of touched on this, but uh, back to our clock radio example. Um, preferences are, are defined by um, the things that are, that are known. Um, and, and those things that are known can oftentimes come from out of category products. So if Emra is exposed Say she shops at Target, um, 
she's walked up and down those aisles before and has seen all kinds of different products for you know various things vacuums and mops and clothes and other electronics that she's just been exposed to therefore because she shops there often enough she knows that it is possible to bring certain design elements into a clock radio right so the more that you get to know her, the more that you're going to understand what else has she been exposed to and therefore where are expectations on what the thing should look like. Same thing could be applied to uh, for function. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe she has another device uh, that uh, has a Bluetooth Connect feature. And now that she knows that that's pretty ubiquitous, well, my clock radio better have a, uh, a Bluetooth Connect as well. So it could be technology as well. Uh, you can also look into uh, new technologies, and this might be a way to create the kind of next step for, for, for Emma here. What I mean by that is maybe, um, maybe there's a, a feature set that's new, like Bluetooth was at one point. Um, and you know, you're, you're in the development space. You just became aware that it's commercially possible to do uh, something with this new technology. The more that you kind of stay at the front edge of what is coming out and what's available, the more, you're, the more likely you are to be able to spot the opportunities to bring in a technological advancement to whatever you're doing. Again, same thing is true in uh, digital development as it is in physical. And then current trends. So I don't know if you guys notice this as much as I do, but um, there Consumer products especially, I mean, you see it in fashion without question, but the same thing uh, happens in consumer products where everything kind of like looks, looks the same. Everything kind of has the same kind of finishes. It goes from matte to glossy and then glossy back to matte. It goes from like sharp to round back to up to sharp again. Um, and then color pops in, right? Like Apple is the king of this. You know, they just, they give you the black one and then they say, here's a white one. Oh, and here's a blue and green and yellow one. Um, so the more that you can familiarize yourself with what those expectations of the way things are moving, uh, again, can help you kind of place a product um, in line with Emma's expectations uh, for what this clock radio could look like. And now finally, uh, the hardest part, creating those delights. So how do people do that? I, I wish I could, I could show you a formula that's like, this is it. Uh, this will work 100% of the time, but that's not the case. I think the people who do do this well do some, some things that, that are different. And again, if you're designing something to meet basic requirements, it's not going to cost you a lot. It's not going to take as much time because you just work with what you have. Um, working with something that you know, has a, a, a slight advantage to your last generation, um, is, is harder because you have to ch make some changes. Uh, but when you're creating the lights, uh, oftentimes you might have to start from scratch. Uh, and, and what that means is the people are most successful, they say, okay, if the problem is um, uh, Emma needs something to wake herself up with, uh, right now she's using a clock radio. Um, the reason that she uses that is because she likes waste waking up with music. Now I'm kind of deconstructing uh, what it is that, that Emma's actually trying to solve. Um, and now, now that I kind of firmly understand like she needs this function, it's like, well, wait a second, this little box right here is not the only way to do that. What if this pillow could do that? Or what if you know, in the ceiling this light could, could appear and you know, music kind of starts coming over? the more that you kind of get back to the very root of what this person is trying to, to, to solve with the, the product that you're selling them, by starting from scratch, you can recreate that experience and all of a sudden it's a new product category. Filling in the gaps. The people that I think that are, that are the best of this is Tesla. Um, what I mean by uh, filling in the gaps is, uh, you know exactly what, you, what, what product you're trying to create, but the technology or the material doesn't exist, so you have to create it. Um, and, and Tesla does that, right? So the, 
it's, it's, it's expensive and it's time consuming, but they care so much about their product and they know that there probably are gonna be some other people that care about it too, uh, they're willing to make that investment. So um, the example for them, I think, is their batteries. So the batteries that were on the market weren't powerful enough for their cars, so they built their own and now they're selling their battery technology to uh, other, or they're giving it away uh, to other uh, companies. So they solve their own problem, they fill in the gaps. Uh, iterate, right? So I, I, I said this before, when you're trying to create what doesn't exist and isn't familiar to people, um, you're guessing. You're just assuming that you've got the solution uh, and if you just roll with what you've got, it may or may not work. So when people talk about um, you know, lean, de lean design and, and, and lean development, they're basically saying, okay, here's a prototype, put it in front of Emma. Does she like it? No. Okay, come back. Uh, here, how, how about this one, Emma? Oh, she likes a little bit more, but she doesn't like the spacing on that button. You know, that iterative process um, of, of developing something, getting feedback, developing something, getting feedback until it's to a place where you're comfortable with it. Immersion uh, is, is anybody who is in design knows the importance of gaining empathy for the users. And the way that you gain empathy is you walk in their shoes. So you put, them so you put yourselves in their environment, you understand uh, the way that they solve problems, um, you understand the pressures that they're making decision, decisions amongst, and you get to know basically all of those things that are influencing that little bar graph that we were looking at earlier, or that little dot graph that we were looking at. Uh, and the more that you get to know that individual, the more that you can design because you feel the same, you feel the same needs. You're solving your own problem. You'll also notice how they're solving their problems themselves, because most people will have a workaround. Again, digital and physical. Uh, digital, look for the hacks. So um, what would be a good example of this? There's a, there's a sales reporting thing that I do for work that's a, that's a hack that I'm using a combination of a CRM, a PowerPoint slide, and a, a Google uh, a Google spreadsheet all manually done because I needed it done a certain way. I'm solving the problem um, of how to get like accurate information in one place. It's a lot of work uh, and I wish I didn't have to do that. I wish somebody would develop a solution to make that all easier, but until somebody comes to meet with me and sit down and watch me do it, they don't know that I have that problem and I guarantee I'm not the only person with that problem. Um, and then on the product side, uh, I, I heard this thing that just blew my mind a few years ago, and it's, it's so simple. It's just look for the duct tape. Uh, so, and literally, look for the duct, the, the duct tape. Go to extreme situations and figure out, you know, how are they using just these simple solutions to solve a problem? And then get back to the basics. Um, when you're designing something, the the... Um, adjectives we were throwing out earlier were um, you know, simple and understandable. And those are kind of like basic, basic kind of human uh, characteristics that we all like. But there are kind of, there are some that are even, you know, more rooted down. You think of Maslow's hierarchy, you know, space, uh, having a, a safe place to sleep, um, feeling that you're, you know, you've got food. Uh, I can't remember all the steps, but basically you're working up towards self-actualization. Along the way, you've got, you have family and friends and, and you know, you want to procreate. These are the things that the most successful products are based around. You know, it, it's, it's no, it's, it's no, uh, it's no mistake that the iPhone looks the way that it does. You know, some, that, some of that's related to the materials they select and the technology that's involved with it. But the reason that it looks different from some of the other phones, especially when it first came out. It was, uh, it, it signaled something, it signaled something that no other phone was doing at that time. And what that was signaling was, hey, look at me, um, I'm doing pretty well. Uh, I might be a good, suitable candidate for you know, having a family with and extending our lineage. It's pure evolutionary, uh, you know, separation at at its best. And um, when you get back to the basics with your products, you know, you're unabashedly just going right at 
what people are actually, you know, motivating, what's actually motivating them to, to use certain products. And that's because products and services are really just extensions of who we are. Um, so keep that in consideration. Uh, I think that's the last one on, on, on this slide, but I don't know if I jumped over this or if I'm repeating myself here, but um, this is the really, really hard work in design. It's expensive, it's time consuming, uh, and not everybody has the stomach for it. And, and it's not always appropriate. So, uh, but when it is, um, and when it's done well, it's game changing. And all of the products that we walk through at the beginning of the deck um, are, are examples of people who kind of went out of their way to take things to another level. I think that might be it. Okay. All right. So with that, are there any questions? Yeah, Tyler. Yeah, uh, it does. It's how do you know which ones are red and which ones are gray? Uh, and then once you've gone through the process, how do you measure yourself against those? Um, the, the, the tools that I described, um, you know, kind of after this, this slide was how do, you, how do you figure out ways that certain things measure? So there is the homework that needs to be done ahead of time. Um, the best case examples at Worrell uh, with product development um, always start with research. Uh, and not everybody does it, and not everyone can afford it, and that's fine, and we can work around that. But the, truly the best products are the ones that take the time to get to know who a target is. And first to find a target, and then really, really invest the time in understanding what's, how, how are these different from uh, another group. So that, that hopefully answers the upfront one. The how do you measure it against um, it is basically, okay, so now you're basically, you're, you're building your product requirements. So now based on these dots, um, you know exactly what you need to build in from a feature set. So take that requirements and when you get to, your, to the end of developing a product, take a look at that list and say, are these all here? I hope they are, because other than something got lost on the way. And as long as your end product um, you know, meets the requirements that were created before, you're going to avoid feature creep like we talked about, but you're also going to make sure that you're aligning to those expectations that were informed by your, uh, your consumer research. Good question. What else? Nothing. Okay. Well, uh, we got one more. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I just read uh, the the ten types of innovation. It's probably one of the best. There's so many books along that around that subject, and they're not all great. But if you do want to read a good one, this is actually a legitimate book. Uh, and they basically say, okay, product design, which is what we're talking about here, is one of the ten types. The other nine types are business model, partnerships, service uh, models, um, supply chain innovations. These are all things that are existing beyond this. But um, I would hope that the design is never happening in a, in a silo because if it is, you can create the best product in the world. If you don't have the, 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 the resources to sell it, nobody cares. Nobody's ever going to know. You have to have those, those in place. So it doesn't, it shouldn't, and it can't. And if it does, it's not going to work.
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the, I, I don't know if there's a, a uh, silver bullet for, you know, these, check these 10 items off on, on your consumer, you know, knowledge list and you, you've got it set. I love the idea of uh, looking at their activities because basically you're just saying, okay, everything outside of what you have to do to s sustain your life, what do you do with your free time? That almost tells more about somebody than what, you know, how old they are or where they live as an example. So I think activities are a great place to start, but the list is truly endless. I think it's going to be determined by how much do you need to know, how much can you afford to learn, um, and then, you know, based on what my product is, you know, if I'm developing a lifestyle activity product, I sure as shit want to know what, how they're spending their time enjoying their lifestyle, you know? So I would, I would try to look for opportunities of understanding where my product is going to eventually fit and how that exists around the other ways they spend their time. Yeah. Any, well, anybody can do it. Um, and, and, you know, the people who do it day in, day out, they just know the tricks, so it doesn't take them as long. Um, but it really is um, observation, asking good questions, um, creating low level prototypes to give something for people to give feedback to. These are. Anybody can do it. If you can, you know, if you have post-it notes, you can do this. Um, if you have a video camera, you can do it. Uh, it it's, there's, there's, it's accessible to everyone, um, but the advantage of working with other company that do, does it is they, they know how to do it, and they know how to do it faster. So... Good question, though. Yeah, in the back. Yeah. And by bad idea, you mean hard to make. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's hard to develop a, a, a requirement sheet, but it's an important step. Um, so you can always refer back to the, it's essentially a contract. You know, hey, this is what we agreed to. Let's stick to this. But in, the, in your space, I would imagine that is kind of constantly evolving a little bit because you got the second version of your website, I assume, um, and the third and et cetera. Um, I mean, we, we all talked about it earlier when I asked, hey, what is good design? There was like four or five people like, hey, it's simple. Um, and, and that's true. Uh, so in, in that experience, uh, I think the most effective way to do it is say, let's go back to this person who is our core customer. Let's say they're, they're, they're our paying client. Um, what do they think? You know, if they, if they, uh, everybody was like, yeah, y you run into the, the problem of, well, yeah, if you can give me more for the same price, yeah, I'll take it, but maybe they don't know exactly what they need. But, I mean, the, the beauty of product development in, in the web space is you can A-B test. Uh, you, can, you can split your, your audiences um, and just run it, have people 
use usertesting.com to figure out if it's better or worse. There's so many tools, it's awesome. And it's much less expensive than uh, it would be in the product space. I don't know if I really kind of meander around. Just say, uh, get back to your, your core customer. What do they need? Are you solving those needs? Have those needs changed? If the needs have changed, then maybe it does make sense. But if they haven't, why are you doing it if what's working is what it work, what's working? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, I'm not saying this is the same thing for you, but of the designers I work with, they're never satisfied. So if there is no jump date, it will constantly be refined. Um, and that's because design trends are kind of slowly moving and, and you know, what, this is this, this level of satisfaction that's never met. So you have to work within the, the, um, the expectations that exist. Um, like I said before, if, it, if you're looking for just generation two and you really don't wanna, you know, you just need to do something that's slightly better, then it's okay, fast forward. Just do a little bit and make it look a little bit nicer. You know you can do better as a designer but the, the, the strategy isn't to do uh, the mind-blowing product. The strategy is to do generation two. So. so yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a little bit of luck, there's a little bit of timing involved in this. Um, you know, Google Glass is a very interesting product. You got a guy in the back rocking the Google Glass. I'm sorry, friend, but it's not, we're not ready for that yet. Um, so it's ahead of its time. We'll eventually get to something like that, but right now, that's why we're not all wearing that. Um, but, you know, so sometimes you just can't do, sometimes you get lucky and, and um, sometimes the timing is good. Um, and, but sometimes you've, you've gotten to know the issue so well. And that's hopefully what I've gotten, kind of gotten through here is you get to know the issue so well that when people see it, they're like, I can't believe nobody thought about this before. And that's, that's how you know you did a really good job. Uh, is with somebody. Oh, we're out of time? Okay, cool. All right, well, thanks, everybody. Yeah.